I'm Dr. Hannah Hamlin. I am a physician with type 1 diabetes. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to talk to you about how I personally troubleshoot an insulin pump when I'm worried about a technical error or some type of error that's causing me to not have enough insulin in my system. I first want to start by saying that it's really important when we start insulin pump therapy that we learn how to do this so that when challenges come up, we know what to look for in the system that can go wrong. Anytime we start insulin pump therapy, it's important to understand that technical errors are a part of the process. There are pros and cons to any medical decision or even health habit decision, whether it be a medication, medical technology, or something you want to do. Typically things on each side of the spectrum. And one of the things that is a con with insulin pumps in general is that they're susceptible to technical errors. Now, overall, I think that insulin pumps are so helpful for quality of life and blood glucose level improvement that they are worth the cons that they come with. And that has been my experience in trying a lot of the pumps on the market and working with patients who to try different ones as well. So for an insulin pump, when I am concerned about starting to think, is this a technical error? Is there something going on with a pump? Usually what it looks like for me is my blood sugar is rising. It's not responding to a correction and I'm not sure why that is. Now, anytime we have blood sugar that's not responding to a correction, if you've lived with type 1 diabetes for more than a couple days, you've probably figured out already that there are so many things that impact our blood sugar that isn't just insulin and carbohydrates, right? There's stress that can cause insulin resistance. There's lack of sleep that can cause insulin resistance. There's fight or flight hormones we can release if we get really scared on a roller coaster or there's a big test coming up. And so there are all these things that can impact the way that our blood sugar changes. And so sometimes if our blood high and it's not responding to a correction, it's not the insulin pump's fault. It's just our body is changing our sensitivity to insulin. And that is a normal part of physiology. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us, but if I have a high blood sugar, that's not responding to a correction and I don't have a clear understanding why I was pretty confident about the carb count at my last meal. I'm not stressed or sick or don't have any kind of big changes in lifestyle going on. Then I might think, is this the pump that's causing it now? Anytime my blood sugar is over 280 for an extended period of time, I test for ketones. And when we're on an insulin pump, that can be a really helpful tool because it helps us understand, is our body getting enough insulin? If we don't have enough insulin in our system, that's when we start creating ketones. And so if my blood sugar is high and I have ketones, I'm more likely to be having a challenge with getting insulin in. And that's when I question the pump. So what I look for is, could there be an occlusion within the pump where the insulin is held? Could there be an occlusion in the tubing of the pump? Or could there be an occlusion in the site that sits under my skin? The answer is I've seen them in all three places. So no, that's part of it. What we see is that understanding that we're not getting the insulin is helpful. What can happen as well is heat can break down the way that insulin works and make it less effective. That can sometimes look like an error to an insulin pump. I have never experienced that. I see that pretty rarely. I work at a, a summer camp for kids with type one diabetes in Texas in the middle of June, July. It's hundred degrees most days. Again, I see that rarely in people. It does happen. It is worth considering, but that's usually not my first go-to. Usually I'm thinking, where could this be? Now for me, I've experienced more trouble at the site in my skin. That's usually where I would look first. So is the site sensitive? Does it hurt more than it did the day before? I ask myself, is there blood around it? Maybe there's blood and so that's not allowing the insulin to come through. There's not enough pressure. Has it moved a little bit? Is it leaky where I can see that there's space between the site itself where the adhesive isn't sticking anymore? Those are things that might make me think, oh, maybe this site isn't working. I don't have that cannula in my skin. The other thing I might think is, have I been very active or done anything out of the ordinary that may have caused the cannula to move under my skin. And I've had this happen before where sometimes the cannula as it sits under your skin can get kinked. And so it doesn't deliver the insulin and it takes back pressure, but we can not have enough insulin flowing through before the pump catches on to that. And so it's helpful to be aware of that. I had that happen one time when I was traveling and swimming in the ocean and I just had it move around. 
I see kinks more often if I have my site over a muscle belly where there's less fat tissue because muscle is a lot more dense than fat. We're more likely to kink on something dense than something softer. That's something to consider is where is that site? Is this a new location? Are you trying it on the outside of your quad on your leg where you don't have as much fat tissue? That could be part of it. Now, a site can kink in the middle of wearing it. It doesn't have to happen within the first couple hours of putting on the site. My example happened to think a couple days in. And so understand that that's still worth questioning. The next place I would look is the tubing. I've seen kids that actually somehow get an, a whole knot in the tubing where we have to undo it. That can happen. The tubing, did it get compressed on something like in, in between your belt and your jeans? That can happen. So really looking for a kink in the tubing itself. I've also seen leaks in the tubing, so tiny holes. Usually you can smell that, which is helpful, but I've seen where the tubing got somehow nicked on something and the insulin is just leaking out of the tube. The other place that I've seen errors is where the insulin is held in the pump as well. And that can happen because for some reason something got stuck. I see this less commonly, but it's worth questioning as I'm going through my what could be going on. Now, it's important to remember that anytime our blood sugar is elevated, we want to test for ketones. But if we have ketones and high blood sugar, when we have a insulin pump technical problem, we don't have enough insulin on board to prevent those ketones from continuing to grow typically. It's important that we understand ketones are created when we don't have enough insulin. Anytime I'm, if I'm using shots or I'm using a pump, anytime I know I've gone for a little while without insulin, whether that's I forgot to take my long acting insulin on shots or I didn't have my basal rate because my pump had a technical error for more than two hours, let's say, I don't have enough insulin to prevent ketone production. We can see ketones at levels less than 280 milligrams per deciliter of blood sugar. So whenever I have a technical error, my go-to strategy is to take an injection of short-acting insulin in order to make sure I've got insulin on board as soon as possible, because I know that the mechanism of ketone production is halted by insulin. And so if I can get insulin on board, I'm decreasing my risk of progressing towards DKA, which would be the worst case outcome in this situation. You can have technical errors to an insulin pump and not go into DKA. So I don't want you to think that's a common response. It can happen, but there are a lot of pieces that can be addressed prior to that. I've experienced many technical errors with insulin pumps throughout my years on them. And it's a skill of troubleshooting that gives me confidence to wear an insulin pump and feel good about the outcomes that I have and feel clear about what to do when I'm not sure. There are so many times where my questions that I ask myself that we went through this, is it the site? Is it the tubing? Is it where the insulin's coming out? Is the insulin hot? Those questions didn't get me to an answer that was clear. And so I called the manufacturer. I've also called my doctor in this situation. If my blood sugar was elevated to greater than 280 and I was having symptoms of DKA, I would call 911 or I would go to the hospital. So that is my personal protocol. This is not medical advice for you. And this will look different based on your care team and your personal physician and diabetes educator and who you're working with. But it is really important. If you're looking to start an insulin pump and you're a little bit nervous, a great place for up-to-date information on how to troubleshoot is the pump representative that does the training. That's a great time to ask what happens if this goes wrong or that goes wrong. And typically I find they stay pretty up to date with that information. So I hope this was helpful. Overall, I absolutely think an insulin pump is worth the pros and cons of technical errors. It's a part of the process and practicing and learning what can happen is really helpful. I think For me, worst case scenario, if I'm not sure, I'll just change everything out. I'll change the cartridge, I'll change the tubing, and I'll change the site in my skin. That'll give me a fresh restart so that I don't have to wonder or even know exactly where the challenge is coming from. I hope this was helpful for you. If you have any questions that are general about insulin pump management, I'd love to hear them below. If you have experience with troubleshooting an insulin pump, that would be really interesting for us to learn as well in the comments. If you're interested in learning more 
more about type 1 diabetes and the mindset piece, I've got a new course coming out that is designed to help you reframe your relationship with type 1 diabetes as it applies to how you feel about it, how you think about it, whether or not you let it empower you or hold you back from things. That was the hardest part of growing up with type 1 diabetes for me. I'm creating this course to hold your hand through the steps of what a shift in mindset looked like for me. And I'm really excited about it. It will be great for people who are experiencing diabetes burnout or a new chapter of life with diabetes that is challenging or have just never explored mindset around type 1 diabetes or never had the chance to talk about it or think about it with someone who experienced something similarly and want to start. So if you're interested, I have a wait list right now for it. If you would like information when it comes out, feel free to go to my website and join the wait list and I'll let you know when it's ready. Thanks for being here. And if you haven't already liked and subscribed to this channel, that would make a big positive difference to me. It helps other people with type 1 diabetes find this kind of information faster. I hope that you have a wonderful day and I hope to see you next time.